Some of us are heading off for a camping trip next week. And the issue when you prepare for a camping trip is always how much do you take along. If you don't take enough, you're going to put yourself to hardships. If you take too much, you're going to limit your range, how far you can go, because you weigh yourself down. So you have to weigh these two things against each other. And that's the way it is with most of our activities in life. We have to make compromises. We're never totally free. One of my students was going to stay outside of Zion Park one time, thinking about the arrangements. He was hoping to stay for quite a while. We're talking to one of the rangers there, and he said, you know, you can't eat the scenery. You've got to think about the practicalities, and that's what always ties us down. Any thought of total freedom always gets dragged down to earth by the fact that we have to eat. We need certain comforts just to keep going. And most people take that as just the way things have to be, and they don't think outside the box. The Buddha, however, thought outside the box. What if there could be a happiness that wasn't tied down to anything, that wasn't restricted by anything? totally unlimited, totally free. What would that be like? How would you find it? And as the traditional stories tell us, all of his friends and family said, no, it's impossible. Don't even think of it. But he had the courage to want to give it a try. And he ended up finding it in a way that he didn't expect. And the freedom itself was something that lay beyond the imagination. When the Buddha talks about nirvana, the word nirvana itself is, is an analogy. It's just a, an image, a fire going out, which for most of us seems to indicate going out of existence. But that's not what the image meant in the time of the Buddha. The theory was that there was a fire element in things, and when it wasn't burning it was calm and unlimited, undescribable. And when it was burning it was agitated, and it was clinging and bound to its fuel. So when the Buddha used the word nirvana to describe the happiness he'd found, the, end, the implication was that it was totally free. Free from clinging, free from any kind of limitation. People used to ask him to describe it as, do you exist, do you not exist? Are you conscious? Are you not conscious? And he said, you're totally undescribable. Again, he used the image of the fire. He said, when the fire goes out, does it go east, west, north, south? That doesn't apply. In the same way, our normal imagination of what nirvana might be, we try to put it into words, put it into our concepts. In almost every case, the Buddha says, doesn't apply, doesn't apply. The one word that he uses without any qualification is freedom, liberation. In some cases he calls it the ultimate happiness, but even there, he says the mind at that point is beyond our normal sense of pleasure and pain. He does describe it as a kind of awareness. 
awareness without feature, awareness without surface. In other words, it's not an awareness of anything. And it's not known through our normal six senses. He says that you touch liberation with the body, which means that it's a total experience. In one case, he even says that you see it with the body, which means that it's, it's, I think that's meant to scramble up our normal ideas of what things we know through the senses. But it defies the imagination. And for many people, that just puts a stop to their thinking about it. But other people find it a challenge. What if it were possible to find a happiness that's totally free from limitation? Why not give it a try? What if we could live without the limitations that we tend to take for granted, the, the ways we sell ourselves short? It means putting a lot on the line, which is one of the reasons some people shrink away from it. But fortunately, the path doesn't save all of its pleasures for the end. There are difficulties, but many times what look like difficulties turn out to be liberating. When I was first ordained, I remember the part about being a monk that I least was attracted to was all the rules that we had to follow. But as I got to live within the framework of the rules, I found they were liberating in a lot of ways. The rules enable you to live a life where you don't have to worry about tomorrow's meal or your time isn't filled up with lots of activities. You've got lots of time to look at your own mind, to train your own mind. And it's made possible by the rules. And as we meditate, we're going to have to deal with pain. But as you learn how to sit with the pain, and this is inevitable. Even when your posture is perfect, it's going to come, there are going to come times when there's pain in the meditation. You finally decide, well, instead of running away from it, I'll just turn around and look at it. It's like that character in the novel, The Wizard of Earthsea. Most of the novel, he's running away, running away from this very shadowy figure. And he finally decides, okay, if it's going to kill me, or I can't keep on running like this. I've got to turn around and face it. And in facing it, he overcomes it, and then he's free from the shadow that had been tormenting him. And it's the same with pain. You learn to sit with it for a while, put the mind in a, as steady a state as possible. This is why we work with the breath, to give a sense of ease and comfort, feeling that we belong in our own skin, we belong in our bodies. We know that we have a safe place to go. Then you can turn around and look at the pain and not be afraid of it. You don't have to run away from it anymore. Then you begin to see that it was like that shadow. It was amorphous and ill-defined, which is why we're afraid of it. Once you can actually look at it, once you can comprehend it, you start asking questions about it. Where is the pain the worst? What shape does it have? How do I picture it to myself? How does that picturing it make the pain worse? Why is it that physical pain makes inroads in the mind? This is one of those things we take for granted, but it doesn't have to happen. We realize it's the way we label the pain, the way we perceive it, that makes it a burden on the mind. 
what if we can learn how to drop those labels, watch the mind as it's dealing with the pain, and see where the labels make the pain worse. Drop those labels. We find that we can be with the pain and not feel threatened by it. We don't have to keep running from it. And when we turn around and face it, we find that it's not nearly as fearsome as we thought it was. So there are parts of the path that at the beginning look daunting. But we're looking at them from the wrong side. We're looking at the inside walls of our prison. And we're afraid to challenge them. We're afraid to go beyond them, thinking the outside of the prison is scary because the walls themselves are so scary. But when you find you get on the other side, that it was worth the effort that it took to get through the walls. And even our imagination of nirvana. As the Buddha says, you can't describe it as existing or not existing or both or neither. And the person there can't be described as existing, not existing, both or neither. And it seems like a big blank. But nirvana itself is not a blank. It's just that our mind goes blank trying to think about it, because the Buddha thwarts all of our efforts to think about it. He mentions in one of his suttas a state of concentration which is literally mindless, no awareness, no consciousness, nothing at all. And he states very clearly that that's not the goal. He does mention twice that it is there is a kind of consciousness there, but it's not the kind of consciousness that we know in our world of the six senses. He mentions it only twice, but then again, there are lots of important teachings that he mentions only twice. The fact that defining karma as intention occurs only once in the canon. His definition of sensuality occurs only once in the canon. His definition of the world occurs only twice. His definition of the two kinds of nirvana, the nirvana ex experienced it while you're alive and the nirvana experienced at death, that occurs only once. It doesn't mean that simply because the, occurrence, the occurrences are so few that these are unimportant teachings. It's just that trying to imagine nirvana is not the path. When we get too tied up in our efforts to imagine it, we get deflected from what we're supposed to do, which is to focus on developing the path. It's only that way that the, the goal can be experienced. But it is useful every now and then to try to stretch your imagination. There is a happiness. It's not limited in any of the ways that we're familiar with, in any of the ways we've learned how to accept. John Mahabhu makes a comparison with being in prison. Some people decide, okay, prison food, I guess, is good enough. It keeps me alive. I'm not going to think about food outside the prison or what life is like outside the prison. And there are some teachers who say that nirvana is simply learning how to be equanimous about the way things are. Well, it's learning how to accept life in the prison. So it's good every now and then to stretch your imagination. Maybe it is possible to find ultimate, true, total, unlimited freedom. And as we hold that possibility in minds, take a look at our lives. How are we living our lives? What are the things that make us allow ourselves to sell ourselves short? So I'd rather stay in the prison put up with the walls, allowed myself to be chased around by pain, afraid to turn around and look at it, 
free to question many of the things that I've accepted. When you look at the Buddha's life, the stories he tells about what he had to do in order to ultimately get to awakening, many times it was stopping and asking himself a question, why do I put up with X? Why do I look for my happiness in things that are going to die, grow ill, age, turn into something aside from happiness? Why do I allow myself to be governed by pain? Why do I allow myself to be governed by fear? Why don't I look into which of my thoughts are skillful and which ones are unskillful? These are the questions he would pose to himself, the kind of question that you, where you suddenly stop and look at That's something you've been taking for granted for so long and accept that things have just got to be this way and there's no way around them, so I might as well not think about them. Well, he would stop and think and say, well, why does this have to be this way? What if it, what if it weren't necessary? What if I didn't have to be afraid of pain? What if I didn't have to be governed by fear? What if I could step outside my thoughts? And it was in asking those questions that he could expand his imagination. So it's an important part of our practice that we too ask questions that expand our imagination, our sense of what's possible. Even if we don't get all the way to the goal in this lifetime, at least we've expanded our minds and learned to find a greater measure of freedom as we're on the path, as we learn not to take those prison walls for granted. have a sense that our life can reach the other side.